Welcome back to a new episode of Let's Talk About Star Wars with Maggie Lovett. We're going to start off today's episode a little bit differently. Yesterday on Twitter, I asked if anyone had any questions for me, and I got a bunch of great questions that I'm going to read through and answer right now. Eli over at Star Wars and a Galaxy podcast asked, what is your favorite, it's like poetry, it rhymes, example from Star Wars? Whether it's movies, TV, canon, callbacks, references, you get the gist. Um, so as much as it pains me to discuss The Rise of Skywalker, um, I do have to say that Ben Solo being able to bring back the girl he loves um, was definitely a moment that I liked kind of calling back to Anakin's desire to save Padme from death. Um, wasn't super happy with the execution of the whole it's like poetry moment, um, but I definitely think it's one of the better ones that we have seen through canon. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Ryan Davis asked, how am I supposed to feel about Baby Yoda eating, you know? Um, I think I'm in the minority of the fandom. Um, I didn't have a problem with the child eating what he ate. Um, he is a child and children are notorious for putting things in their mouths that they shouldn't. Um, and I, I just felt like it was just playful, like poking at children will be children. Um, so I didn't really take an issue with that. I, I know people have some very valid concerns where that is involved, um, and they are right to be concerned. Uh, Bob the Burger Guy asked, what do you think about the new Star Wars Christmas special coming to Disney Plus. Um, I'll watch it. I'm not super like excited for it. I'm not a huge fan of Legos like in general. I like actual Legos, but the Legos movies and video games are <sighs> cringy to me. So I I'm kind of indifferent. I am excited to see the child as a Lego and I'm excited to see what they do with Ben Solo. I just talked about this last night on the Geeky Waffle live stream. Um, but that's basically the two things I'm excited for when it comes to um, the Christmas special. So let's hope that we get like an alternative The Rise of Skywalker out of the Christmas special and then I'll be happy. Um, Bob also asked um, about how I stay positive. Um, and also said I'm freaking amazing, which is so nice. Um, thank you so much. Um, so one of the only things that I posted about on Twitter as my New Year's resolution for 2020 was that I wanted to stay positive. Um, if any of you followed me back at the end of 2019 and The Rise of Skywalker, which has now been mentioned twice, um, I was really negative. And I really didn't like feeling negative about something that I loved, um, like Star Wars. And so I just was like, I'm going to be as positive as possible um, in all aspects of my life. And I had no idea how crazy 2020 was going to be, but um, kind of focusing ahead and trying to manifest like positive energy and like putting things out there into the universe and seeing what kind of like you attract back has been like really important to me this year. Um, and I know the fandom has a lot to say about people who are like very positive um, in regards to toxic positivity, um, which is something that you can miss me with that. I'm not about like being positive. Um, to like the extent that some people try to put on. Um, I am very much in the mind of being genuine. Um, so you can still love something and still approach it constructively. Um, there's definitely been things that Star Wars has done in the last couple of years that I do not think is the right direction, um, especially some of the stuff in the Boba Fett uh, comic books, the Bounty Hunter comic books. Um, it definitely made me super uncomfortable and I'm not afraid to talk about it. Like you should be able to talk about things that you love and not fear um, how people are going to react. Um, I know it's easier said than done, um, but I really think it's important to try to approach things constructively. And that's what I do when I look at Star Wars. Uh, Buffy asked me a bunch of really great questions about Mandalore um, and Mandalorian in general. Um, she asked, does Mando shove the food under his helmet or eat it alone? Um, well, we saw in chapter four um, when Omira brought him food that he waited for her to leave and then he took his helmet off and ate while watching the children play outside. Um, so we know that he takes the helmet off. Um, was kind of hoping we'd see that since he was like going to take a nap and like was eating and stuff 
in this most recent episode, but we didn't see that. Um, but I would assume he just waits until no one's around and then like takes his helmet off and eats. Um, hoping we see more of that at some point in this season. Um, she also asked, why is Helmet on a tenant of the way? Um, really interesting question. I don't know the answer to. I am certain we're going to get that at some point, either in this season or next season, uh, especially if Mando interacts with other Mandalorians who are not quite so bound by the same creed that he is, especially if we interact with someone like Bo-Katan or Sabine, who obviously don't wear their helmets. Um, it will be really interesting to see um, Mando's reaction. Um, we know how he reacted last week with uh, Cobb Vanth not being a Mandalorian and wearing the armor and taking the ha helmet off. Um, so really interested to see how that's going to happen, um, if it happens. Um, what planet do you want to see the Mando side of? Uh, Naboo. Uh, I would just love to see if there are Mandalorians in Naboo, um, given how grand their architecture is and their style of fashion. I am certain the Mandalorians are blinged out in some form or fashion. Um, so I would really like to see that. Um, also, I just really would love to see Naboo again. One of my favorite planets in the Star Wars galaxy. Um, what is your favorite crazy theory? Um, I don't know if it's a like a favorite crazy theory, but I am all about Darth Jar Jar. The idea that Jar Jar is the one that has orchestrated everything in the galaxy is Ah, uh, Misa loves it! <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't really hold on to too many crazy theories. I don't know, I have learned from past fandom experiences that theories tend to only make you really disappointed, um, so I don't really stick to that too much. Um, what theory do you love so much even if canon can't fully dislodge it? Um, one of my favorite headcanons from fandom is Ben Solo is Jewish. Um, the Kylo Ren fans came up with this. I feel like it was between The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. I think it started on Tumblr and then transitioned into Twitter. And I just love it. You can't take that away from me. Um, I will hold on to that for the rest of my life. Um, Alan asked, how rare do you take your crate dragon meat? Um, I'm mostly vegetarian, so I will not be partaking in the crate dragon meat. Um, I will say that moment, um, for anyone who has been to Batu, um, when the droid was cooking the crate dragon, all I could think of was, turn, <laughs> turn. Um, I love that droid in Batu, and I want him to have his own little Funko Pop. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, and then Catherine asked, a lot of people are saying that this past episode, Chapter 10, felt like a filler episode. How do you feel about it? There is no such thing as a filler episode. Um, especially in a series that is only eight episodes long, you're not going to get filler episodes. I know people said last season that the Tatooine episode was filler, but look how it's paid off. We've now seen more of the same characters we met in Tatooine the first time, and we've expanded on it. You just have to have patience. Um, I also am kind of to the point where filler is just as aggravating as fan service. Not everything that is a callback is fan service. Once again, I'm going to mention the rise of Skywalker. I feel like that word just got thrown around so much. Um, I don't believe in it to the same extent. I think there has definitely been fan service uh, throughout Star Wars because, I mean, fans are kind of what keeps the franchise going. Um, but I, I don't think that The Mandalorian is utilizing fan service in the same way as a movie like The Rise of Skywalker did, um, or even the sequel trilogy in general. Um, I think that their callbacks, um, especially since The Mandalorian is kind of catering to people who might not be fully aware of the entire Star Wars galaxy, I know they definitely have attracted non-Star um, Wars fans uh, just because Disney Plus, I mean, everybody wanted to get Disney Plus. Um, so I think that a lot of the fan service, quote unquote, is more just a homage to what George Lucas has done, especially with Dave um, Villioni working on this project, who really is like the last of George's Padawan, so to speak. Um, and so I think a lot of it is just George's um, creation kind of coming through with new creators. Um, so I don't really think it's a filler episode. I'm sure the things that we have learned in this episode will then 
kind of go on to the next episode. Um, kind of already know that based on the trailer. Um, so I just, I think it was just a way to get him from Tatooine to wherever his next step is and also play with some imagery that I think was really interesting. Um, so I, I do not agree with the, the camp that thinks of filler as every episode that might be a little bit slow. So that's basically where I am with that. Um, that being said, we are also going to talk about from a certain point of view. So I got sent from a certain point of view last week um, from Delray Books. I wrote a review for Your Money Geek about the book and then decided I was going to talk about it on here as well. Um, as a kid who grew up with the expanded universe and having an entire collection of books, um, it is super surreal for me to get these books sent to me um, from Disney and from Delray. Um, dreams do come true, kids. Um, you can get Star Wars books to give your opinions on uh, if you manifest it. Um, but that being said, this book is fantastic. Like, there are 40 stories, it's over 500 pages long. I know that people are going to find fault in some of the stories just because that's how the Star Wars fandom rolls. Um, I know the A New Hope, from a certain point of view, was met with a lot of misplaced scrutiny. Um, I know people complained about some of the stories being goofy and that the tone didn't really match A New Hope. Um, but I am here to tell you that Star Wars is goofy. Star Wars is fake and in space, and there are some absolutely bizarre things that happen in Star Wars. Um, I think The Mandalorian's most recent episode with Frog Lady kind of like shows that it's kind of a goofy show and kind of a goofy franchise, and it is okay for the stories in these books to be a little bit goofy. That being said, um, this book doesn't really have any goofy stories. Um, a story about a wampa made me actually cry, and maybe that's just to say what the current state of affairs in the world was like this week that a wampa made me cry, but that was my favorite story in this book. Now I am releasing this episode before the book is out for the general population, so I do not want to spoil anything. Um, you know for the most part who all the authors are um, based on the articles that Star Wars has posted and social media and the authors talking about it on Twitter, um, so it really isn't any surprise to know that there are stories by Jason Fry, Gary Whitta, um, Daniel Jose Older, Alexander Freed, Kevin Scott, um, Delilah Dawson, all of these authors that we've already read previously. Uh, so it's really exciting to get to see their takes on different characters. Um, I really love Jason Fry's story about Wedge Antilles, who is not someone who's ever really been on my radar as far as characters go, um, but there are some moments in that story that just cracked me up. I definitely needed that laugh this week. Um, and then you also have stories about, like I said, Wampas, which was fantastic and was from an author I had never read before. Um, there's also a story um, by Hank Green, um, which I grew up watching the Green Brothers on YouTube, and so it was really cool to see someone who I know is a Star Wars fan getting to write a story about Star Wars. Um, and his story was really interesting. Um, it wasn't exactly what I expected it to be, but I think that a lot of people are really going to like that story because it approached some aspects of Star Wars uh, slightly differently. Um, but one of the things I really like about these anthologies is that uh, you get to see a much more diverse swath of authors writing a much more diverse swath of stories. Um, so there are stories about rebels, there are stories about imperials, there are stories about droids, there's LGBT stories, there's all of these things that Star Wars so desperately needs more of, um, and new approaches and different viewpoints, and so I really love anthologies and this is fantastic. And I cannot wait to talk about this more once everybody has started reading it, because there's some really good stories in here. Um, so if you haven't already pre-ordered it, you should definitely pre-order it. Um, I will also link my review um, for Your Money Geek below this video so that you can read that if you want some very mild spoilers. Basically just highlighted the stories that I thought were the best. I'm also going to be guesting on the podcast um, Friends of the Force um, with Brad, and we are going to be talking about this the latter half of the book a little bit more in depth, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, also talking about authors from the Star Wars anthology book, uh, this week we got to interview Gary Witta over on um, Star Wars Friends show, which was 
super surreal, um, especially as a huge Rogue One fan. Um, it really felt like a culmination of four years of using Rogue One as my crutch and then getting to interview one of the writers of the screenplay on the eve of the election. So it was perfect, perfect. Uh, it's poetry, it rhymes for me. Um, and we're going to be posting that over on the Star Wars Friends podcast YouTube channel so you can actually watch the interview. We did it as a video, so it's super awesome. And that'll be linked somewhere on the screen. So we have come to the end of yet another episode. I hope that you check out from a certain point of view, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, I can guarantee that you don't have a bookmark as cool as the bookmark I have. Um, always have a little peeping Han Solo over the corner of your books while you're reading. Um, I hope you pick it up. Uh, it's 500 pages long or so. You will have so much fun getting to see so many different points of view. Um, I guess people have been enjoying my um, like product opening unboxing. Um, so today I'm going to be unboxing socks. <laughs> Um, most kids don't want to get socks, but um, I want socks with a child on them. Um, so I bought these at Target. Um, thank you to everyone who sent me links to them. I woke up one day and I had five messages, both on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, of people sending me these. Um, so I am glad that everyone knows my brand. Um, I bought a pack of Star Wars socks last year and I wear them all the time. I had bought them hoping that they would have the child on them. None of them did. It was like a few months or a few weeks actually after the Mandalorian had ended. So I guess I shouldn't have been that surprised. Um, but they finally have the child. So I bought these. So let's see what some of the socks look like. I'm not going to force you to look at 15 pairs of socks. Um, right out of the top, we have IG-11, our beautiful nurse and protector. Let's see what else we have. Um, we have the child and Mando's helmet. Very cute. Let's see what else do we have. Reaching in deep. Ooh, two for the price of one. Um, precious cargo socks. Uh, these just say Star Wars. Let's see what else. What else? Um, oh yeah. I'm going to wear these all the time. Let's see what else? What else? What else? Okay. I'm going to do two more. Two more. Um, me on Twitter watching uh, Pedro Pascal take down the fandom menace right now. Sipping my tea. And then another of the child and the pram. Just super adorable. There's still like a bunch more. Like I said, a bunch more. Uh, so I will be going through all of these and wearing them. Okay, these are my favorite. It's my favorite color. These are awesome. So many cool socks. Um, and then let me clear off all of the socks. Oh, well. Um, I also got this from ColourPop this week, which I am wearing. This palette is so cute. And just really nice uh, pigmentation. The only downside with this, um, if you are someone who wears makeup, is that the palette doesn't really work well with brushes and it is more of a finger application product. I'm not a huge fan of ColourPop, but they had the child and I couldn't say no because I'm weak uh, when it comes to the child. Also, the, the swatch color names are hilarious. There's literally one called Right Hand Mando, which is my new favorite color, ironically. Um, but yeah, if you wear makeup or you have someone in your life who wears makeup, I think that ColourPop is going to do another release of this. Don't hold me to that, but I have seen some people talking about it. Um, it wasn't expensive. Um, it was honestly one of the cheapest palettes I've ever bought, so totally worth it. Um, next week I will be unboxing something I bought on Shop Disney uh, because sometimes I wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning and think I should buy talking Mandalorian toys. So we'll see how that goes for me. Um, I am just so happy that there are over a hundred of you subscribed to me. I love all of you. 
Uh, if you aren't a subscriber, hit that bell. I think I forgot to say that last week. Uh, but I will be back next week with another episode. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments of this video or you can hit me up over on Twitter. I think I'll probably do that every week because I really enjoyed uh, interacting with everyone um, and getting some really cool questions. So I hope you have a really great week and may the force be with you.